Thank you all for coming. Welcome to the brand new Situate Public Safety Complex. We haven't even had the ribbon cutting for the building yet, so you're one of the first to be here. Um, I'm Patricia Van Casey. I'm the Situate Town Administrator. I'd like to introduce the folks that are here in the seats. Uh, Tony Vignani, best, uh, Vice Chairman of the Situate Board of Selectmen, Representative Jim Cantwell, our new rep, uh, Joan Moschino, close enough, Senator Patrick O'Connor, and of course, uh, our, our uh, honored guest today, Senator Markey. Um, we've been trying to build this building on order of three years and just moved into it last month. And one of the perks of my position is I get to make sure that the podium lowers. <laughs> so that was a big, Chief will tell you, that was a big important thing that the podium went up and down. So, uh, Senator Markey, welcome, yeah. finally, to Situate, the Irish Riviera, most Irish town in America, 47.7% of Irish descent in the town of Situate. Um, and I think Situate uh, is like a laboratory for many of the issues that you've been passionate about while serving on major committees, focusing on science, transportation, and the environment. You chair the U.S. Senate uh, Committee on Climate Change Clearinghouse and are the former chair of the House Sub Select Committee on Energy, Independence, and Global Warming. You've been talking about climate change for over 10 years. And we just saw um, sort of what Situate experiences relative to those issues. Um, as you know, Situate was the first community in Massachusetts to provide over 100% of its energy clean energy to power all our public buildings with our wind and solar array revenues. And we are a leader now because of our situation with storms in addressing coastal impacts and um, all the things that have come with climate change and sea level rise. Uh, we know that the other thing that's a particular concern to you and is concern to us is the opioid epi uh, epidemic. And that's why we chose our opportunity for you to come to our town to sort of talk about what our efforts here have been in situate the past five years, but also you have a, a wealth of talent and knowledge and expertise with a variety of South Shore folks who have been working on this issue. And what we'd really like to do is have an informal discussion with you, maybe something a little different than being talked to or talked at about a lot of this stuff. Um, we know that you've called for more federal support and legislation for opioid addiction, and you briefed the Legislative Commission at the State House on April 3rd about this, and even yesterday you were talking about it again in Taunton. So we'll do that. Um, for those of you who don't know, Senator Markey was elected to Congress in 1976. He was elected to 19 terms before he became our U.S. Senator in 2013. And that's the professional senator you know. But most of you or some of you know that I also have a personal connection to Ed because from 1979 to 1985, I was a member of his staff. And I worked in his Boston office, and then I worked in two campaigns, and then I worked in his Washington office. And I can tell you to this day, and I do tell people this, I never in my life have worked harder than I did on his election campaign. <laughs> From 6 a.m. visibilities at Oak Grove to 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. commuting back, holding signs on corners, um, calling people, it was the hardest I ever worked in my life. Um, but I can tell you that along with his tireless work as our senator, he is a compassionate and caring person. And he never ever forgets his constituents or where he came from from the city of Malton in a working class family. He called me after my dad died, 13 years after I stopped working for him. He called me last month after the tornado in Conway in the town where I live. And he combines, I think, what we think are, I would think are the best qualities anybody could want in their senator. And after 38 years of knowing him, it is my privilege and honor to introduce and welcome Senator Edward Markey to the city. Thank you, Trish. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we knew that she was a big star back then um, because um, right from the very beginning, 
uh, you could tell that she had this great sense of humor and a point of view, okay, which you all hear in situate. It's a point of view, but it's with this kind of sense of humor that she's able to bring into every situation, but it's towards producing um, work product, goals that are achieved. You know, and, and I know that happens in Situate where you have 100% uh, renewable electricity. What other city in a town in the United States can do that uh, to, to make a claim of that kind of an achievement? Except for Situate, here we are. Uh, and these new buildings which you have, the incredible work that she is doing to find the funding for the sea walls. Um, but um, from my perspective, I have known her since she was uh, very young. Um, and, uh, and so obviously working on my Washington and Boston staffs, um, it's a, like a perfect combination as well to understand where all of the programs are that can disproportionately benefit Situate. Okay, so, <clears throat> so you get more than your fair share mm -hmm. of all of the programs which are available because she has been thinking about all of these kinds of projects her entire life. And so I, I love Trish, and I've known her her whole life for the most part, and we're very proud of her as well, uh, especially what she did in Conway. You know, that was just somebody waking up in the morning saying, what can I do? And that's kind of who she is uh, in a nutshell. And uh, we thank all of you for uh, being here. Um, we just took a little tour of the seawall uh, project. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that's something that obviously is going to grow as an issue. Uh, climate change is real. The oceans are warming. Um, when you look up at Greenland, uh, it's just one big ice cube on top of uh, a piece of land. Uh, the, the ice mass on Greenland is a thousand miles long, 300 miles wide, and a mile high. So as each year goes by and we look at that ice formation uh, and we look at the ocean next to it, we can see the calving of the uh, icebergs coming off of the <coughs> uh, off of the uh, 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 Yavoshabin uh, uh, ice formation up there. Uh, we're right now here outside of uh, Massachusetts, we have the fastest warming body of water in the world. The fastest warming body of water in the world. And so that means the tides are higher, the storms are more intense. Even when we had that winter of 113 inches of snow, that was during a year where um, in uh, Anchorage, they had 21 inches of snow that winter. Uh, and what had happened is the currents, the, the air currents are changing. Uh, and so we just had this super cold air coming down and hitting us. But as it hit our ocean, which is getting warmer and warmer, that's what created that kind of Gronkowski-like spike of snow that hit us. It's, it's that kind of a change which is creating this incredible issue that Situate has to deal with and it's only going to intensify as the years go by. But there's another storm that is coming. Uh, it's already here um, and it's only going to intensify, uh, which is the opioid crisis. Uh, in Massachusetts in 20. Uh, 16, 2,000 people died from opioid overdoses. Um, of them, 1,500 had fentanyl in their blood system. Massachusetts is 2% of the population of the United States of America. We're about 6 million people out of 300 million people, 2%. So if you took our 2,000 deaths and you multiplied them by 50, which would be the whole country, that would be 100,000 people dying from opioid overdoses in one year. Two Vietnam Wars every year. Um, if you took our 1,500 deaths from fentanyl, 
uh, out of those 2,000, and you just took fentanyl and you multiply that by 50, that would be 75,000 people dying from fentanyl overdoses every year in the United States. So only 33,000 people died in the United States last year from opioid overdoses, which is a much smaller percentage of people who would have been affected if they were dying at the same rate as people in Massachusetts. 33,000. It would be 100,000 if it was the same rate as Massachusetts for the whole country. It would be 75,000 from fentanyl. So we're being hit at about three times the rate as the rest of the country. And to a certain extent, we are a preview of coming attractions for the rest of the country if we uh, don't, as a nation, put in place the protections against it occurring and the treatment that helps families to be able to deal with the issue. We all know you cannot incarcerate your way out of this problem. And so <clears throat> I, yesterday with Representative Cantwell, um, who is chairing a very important committee to look at this opioid crisis uh, in our country, we were in Taunton yesterday. And uh, Representative Ke uh, Senator Keenan and, uh, and uh, Representative Cantwell came over uh, so that we could have a round table there in Taunton. The reason I went to Taunton is that in January of 2014, as the, um, uh, 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 as the speaker at Martin Luther King Day, January 15th, 2014, I was standing in the back of the room just like this, uh, and the mayor was there, Mayor Hoy and Chief Walsh, of the police department and I said to them what is the biggest issue in town and they said well it's opioids and we think fentanyl which is being added to the heroin to the cocaine uh, and how bad is it chief he said well it's terrible it's something that's happening every single day so what I said was I'll come back next month and what I did in February of 2014 was bring back Gil Kurlikowski who was the drug czar for the United States uh, and I brought back a whole, uh, brought a whole other team of people who were experts on this issue but they weren't experts on fentanyl they were hearing about fentanyl in a city in Massachusetts with the experts who were the police department the fire department the emergency responders the mayor huh? That's where we were going to learn about the issue. Not from the pharmaceutical industry, not from the physicians, not from uh, <coughs> the, the federal government. It was definitely something that the local communities were dealing with that just hadn't been fully uh, understood. So we went back yesterday uh, to, like three years later, to have another summit in the same firehouse where I had the first summit uh, to talk about what has happened over these years. And of course, what has happened is that the rise in fentanyl is to a point now where in Taunton they say, and I'd love to find out here um, <coughs> uh, uh, what is happening in this area, that now 95% of the cases of fentanyl in, um, uh, in Taunton. And so maybe in the course of today we can learn a little bit more about what is happening here, how it's all transformed. Uh, I went down to Mexico about four weeks ago with Ben Cardin, who is the lead Democrat on the Foreign Relations Committee. I serve on the Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, so we went down to talk to the leaders of Mexico and Mexico City about this fentanyl epidemic, uh, about uh, the need for Mexico to understand what is going to be an expectation from our country about their interdiction of um, that drug coming into uh, our country. Um, Secretary Kelly, the head of the Department of Homeland Security, when he was being confirmed as secretary, said that a wall is not going to keep these drugs out of our country. And we just have to be realistic about it. We're going to need better police cooperation, better interdiction, um, better methodologies which we use in order to capture it at its source. And for fentanyl, it's largely the Chinese who, uh, who produce uh, the precursor chemicals to fentanyl, and then it gets shipped into uh, Mexico, where then in Mexico it gets turned into products that can get sold onto the streets of America. And for us, um, 
what happens is that El Chapo's gang um, is the source for our region uh, and it comes up through New York City and then it comes over to Massachusetts and New Hampshire uh, and it is distributed uh, into our communities which is why New Hampshire and Massachusetts are number one and number two per capita in deaths related to fentanyl in the whole country. Okay, so that's the pathway in through El Chapo's gang. <coughs> so this is uh, something that we're clearly going to have to deal with. I believe that it should be elevated to a level that is equal to nuclear nonproliferation to trade into copyright. Uh, I believe that when President Trump was talking to President Xi of China, that fentanyl should be at the top of the list. Um, I believe that when he is talking to the President of Mexico, it should be at the top of the list. When 100,000 people per year, if everyone was dying at the rate of people in Massachusetts, uh, could occur, then the terrorist threat for people in America is not in Aleppo or Mosul. The terrorist threat is the call to a family member saying yet another member of that family has been affected by this opioid epidemic. That's the terrorist call huh, that we want to avoid. And so from my perspective, we have this great uh, opportunity in Massachusetts to be um, the leader. And that is my goal. And so I partnered with um, uh, Jim Campwell on these issues. and. I want to work with uh, Senator O'Connor and Representative Machino uh, to do the same thing. This has to be a bipartisan issue. It has to be one where Democrats and Republicans are working together. Um, we need more money um, to help the communities deal with these issues. A vision without funding is an hallucination. Right? You, you just can't do it if you don't have the resources in the community to make it possible to provide the services to uh, <coughs> to uh, give the help to the families uh, where they are living. So I'm working very hard to release the $500 million. They just uh, announced today, the Department of Health and Human Services, that Massachusetts is going to receive about $12 million uh, out of the $500 million uh, that will be now coming up from the federal government to help in cities and towns, and Trish will be applying sometime later on today in order to get a disproportionate share for uh, Situate. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, that's how I see this issue. It's federal, state, and local. It's the uh, nonprofits all working together to kind of attack this. And I'm looking forward to learning more about uh, what is happening here and how um, all of um, you are. Uh, dealing with this crisis. So again, I thank you, Trish, for everything that um, you are doing, and, um, uh, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So uh, Representative Jim Cantwell, uh, our great leader on this issue up in the State House, thank you for having Senator, me thank down here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator, one, we want to thank you for your leadership on so many issues, uh, but as we just were seeing today, a, a leader on issues relating to coastal adaptation, because we, we keep stressing here we have a triple threat that we're dealing with, the triple threat of rising sea levels, of having more frequent storms, and of having failing or older infrastructure. And you've been such a tremendous partner uh, to Trish and to all of us to make sure that we are getting our fair share of funds here in the South Shore. Now, coastal adaptation, it's really the idea is how to prevent harm. Uh, and we have those protective factors when it comes to that about, we just were seeing about building sea walls, of lifting homes, over 100 structures here in Citroën alone, or doing sand mining that we discussed before. The analogy here to ba the battle against substance misuse is the work that so many of these experts here do, and that's what we want to be hearing from each and every one of them, just as we did yesterday. So the first person you're going to hear from is a person who I say is a rock star in prevention. Uh, and the four issues that we always talk about, when we're trying to tackle this issue, prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery, this young lady I'm going to introduce in one moment runs Situate Facts, which is families, adolescents, communities together against substances. I had the pleasure, Ben Thomas, who runs my office, and I got to go to Washington, Senator, when you met with this young lady, with Anne Marie, and we went to this huge conference of CADCA people all around the country, and it's like everybody knew you. Like everyone was rushing up and saying, Anne Marie! Because they started talking about what should get done to try to prevent this scourge, uh, this terrible battle against opiates. And you were doing every one of them here in situate. 
Uh, and we're very grateful because we learned from you. My wife Jennifer is here who helped start with Ann Kelly Marshfield Facts, which is like a little sister to what gets done here. Um, so without further ado, what we will do is, is to make sure Anne Marie is going to do an, an overview of what gets done in each of these four areas. And then we want to make sure to call upon people who are here, Senator, who can present to you uh, briefly uh, some of the great work that each of them do. And when people do that, we'll make sure you introduce your name, a phone number where you can be reached because this is all going to be on cable and your website so that people can learn more. But in a short amount of time, we want to have as many people being able to speak to you, Senator. Without further ado, our rock star in prevention, Anne Marie. Anne Marie Galvin. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much. Can I invite people to sit down? Because although I talk fast, I have a lot to say. Do you guys want to have a seat? Comfy? Okay, well feel free to come and go as you please. Um, and thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. Um, welcome Senator Markey to our lovely um, hometown here. And I will begin. Um, and like Jim uh, mentioned, I'm going to point out some of our collaborators. So when you um, come back and get to hear from them and ask questions, that will be the most productive use of our time, I believe. Um, so I'm going to go uh, even faster than I normally do. Um, and I'll start um, with just a little bit of background. The town of Situate is a grantee of a federal grant program called the Communities Support Program. So I thank you for constantly supporting that um, congressionally funded program year after year. The, one of the, I'll go through a little bit of the tenets of that primary prevention program, um, but just know that that's the, the framework that we're operating from, um, reducing risk and improving protection in a local community. So the concept is you assess your local problems, you use federal money and federally proven best practices, evidence-based practices to impact change locally. Um, so the nice thing about this is the basics of it are repeatable. So they're doing it in Marshfield and Cohasset and other communities across Massachusetts. Indeed, Massachusetts has is the second most funded state through this federal program. So first is California and second is, is Massachusetts. So there are about 30 of us currently funded and we do collaborate. Um, but that's just a little background on the program. Um, as the, um, just to back this up a little bit further, um, we all realize as stakeholders in the situate community in Massachusetts um, that we are dealing with an opiate crisis. And we have been for some time. Um, for context, we have had um, suffered 22 opiate overdose losses here in our small community in just 10 years. Um, I can't point to a trend that's getting better or getting worse, unfortunately, because we're a small sample size still. Um, but we uh, have between zero and five community members that we lose every year. Um, gratefully, um, none th so far this year, and I, I hope that's because of all our great collaboration. Um, but it's a real concern. It's a concern across Massachusetts, and as the Senator said, across the Northeast. Um, I would like, you know, Massachusetts has one of the highest rates of addiction to opioids and death from opioids, despite all our great work and efforts and state funding and great initiatives. But I want to point out that that correlates to our previous rates of substance use and substance use disorder. It is not new here. We also have very high rates of alcoholism. We have very high rates of marijuana use. We have very, lots of consequences from the harms of substance use that aren't new to fentanyl or to prescription opiates or heroin or anything else. They correlate, they go together because we are a high substance using state, unfortunately. And I like to point out these, these um, frameworks in the background that our Situate High School students painted so graciously for us. They were voluntold. Um, but this is a big picture, right? This is a long term, long term game. And we can't hyper focus on the threat that's imminent right now, which is fentanyl and car fentanyl actually. And, cocaine that is actually fentanyl that people don't even know they're using. We have to look at the big picture, which is substance use disorder, and look at evidence-based practices that fix these safety nets of prevention, of intervention, treatment, and recovery. Despite the Massachusetts model, as I'd like to refer to it, it's really good, believe it or not. Um, probably, um, you know, blue ribbon, if you're looking at the examples across the country. Um, but it's still not saving enough of our community members. Um, so we really need to look at all of the safety nets. Um, so it's a big task, because our grant is really for prevention. Um, but I'm here to share that when you set it up, if you build it, they will come, and all of these things follow. So I'll share a few examples how, of how we can do even more. Um, very quickly, um, we've had success since receiving this grant. We're in our fourth year of a five-year grant cycle. Uh, I am now a town employee coordinating the grant effort, so thank you for hiring me. 
and um, we've had great success. Um, when we looked, of course I got involved because of overdose deaths in the community, because of the family history of substance use disorder. I'm very passionate about this topic. I had no idea what I was getting into at the time, but I really wanted to do what I could as a citizen and as a parent of four little kids to get to the heroin problem. What is going on here in this beautiful, awesome town where everybody cares and is so active? And when unpeeling the layers realized um, that there is a pathway of course, from pills to heroin, but prior to that, there's risky substance use. And prior to that, there are risk factors for substance use disorder. Half of those we're born with, so at least 50% of, of addiction is genetic. So the things we can do really, really upstream that Jim will talk about later, I'm sure, to reduce risk in our communities, mm -hmm. long before we're ever talking about misusing pills or smoking weed every day before school. Um, and we have achieved some of those early prevention gains with the federal grant. I'm happy to report that in the six years that we've been collecting data through a CDC survey called the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, um, high school drinking is down 18%. When we started as a community coalition, our monthly um, use was at 50% of all of our high school students drinking on a regular basis. <coughs> our binge drinking rates are down 21%. We were at 38% of all of our high school students when we got started, and now we're at 30. We have a lot of work to do in this area because at 30% of current use, we're still well above the state average of 18%, which is also the national average. Um, and our high school marijuana use is also down 20%. We were 35% when we started and now we're at 28%. Um, and people often ask me, they come to me as a parent in the community and they know I'm always out there doing this programming, how's the opiate use at Situate High School? I, get, I feel that question a lot and I say, it's good. It always has been good because young people are not using heroin. They haven't been and we hope that they won't turn that. It doesn't even look like it's turning that way. Addiction is a progressive disease. It doesn't start with heroin or even prescription drug misuse. It starts with those risk factors that we were talking about, including early use. So we're happy to reduce early use, and we're gonna continue um, to target those risk factors where we're able to as a community and as a commonwealth. Um, remarkably, through the collaborative model that we've set up, which is not just the town, it's not the police officers arresting the drug dealers or the health teachers teaching the kids or the good parents and the bad parents or the good kids and the bad kids. It's none of that. It's the whole community together at the table. And I'd say that is, besides the, you know, the federal, um, federally proven programs implemented locally, the best part, I think the magic to this model, this DFC model, is getting everybody at the table. So it's not a, a town problem or a school parent problem, but rather our own um, shared responsibility. So that's really the model we use through open coalition meetings, inviting the entire community, parents, teachers, treatment providers, police officers, state representatives, people in recovery, the whole kit and caboodle comes and we talk about what we're ready to do um, and what really the problems are. Um, we have, sh we have um, effectively been able to move beyond just prevention in situate, and I'll share a few of those examples at the end of my so-called brief overview. Um, and what has been really special is that we've been able to share what we've learned here in situate. We're a small community of 18,000 people with our neighbors. You know, we're all on online and we're all driving around, including our kids, and it's just as easy for me to share my substance use resource guide with my friends in Marshfield, swap out the logo, and print. And we do that all the time. You know, there's often one or two of us doing this work, coordinating this work at the local level. Um, so we do a great job with collaboration. And we're happy to also advocate at the state level when we can. Um, so the, the three tenets of, um, of our success and this grant approach are using all sectors engaged in the work, using evidence-based practices, and also using data to drive our strategies. Even though I got involved because of overdose deaths, I learned by looking at the data, so the school data, the treatment emissions data, the overdose death data, the police arrest data, the school discipline data. We had to really look at the picture and say, oh, we're really talking about alcohol and marijuana in many cases as first lines of defense. Um, so we have to use that. And we also, of course, look at the other things as well as, as people unfortunately move along. I'd like to share just very briefly a few program examples that we implement in Situate and recommend for our neighbors and friends. Um, first is universal prevention education in school. Um, Governor Baker has certainly come out in support of um, school-based universal strategies. Life skills is one of the programs that is well-researched and recommended. But the nice thing is, the, you know, we don't have to reinvent education or curriculum. It's all out there. Um, so coalitions that are startup coalitions can look to these registries um, that SAMHSA has done all the research for us. Um, we have Greg Ranieri here who co-chairs our community coalition. He is helped start this grassroots effort way back when um, and is the chair of 
health education, um, health and wellness for Situate Public School District. And I can't say enough about having that inside <coughs> person um, to really get this coalition moving. Um, so he can speak to some of the educational programming and our, um, our effort to really even roll it down to younger kids on social emotional wellness in elementary school. So ask Greg some questions about that. Um, we've also added very early on targeted education for parents. We realized very early with wonderful schools and pro-social activities and beaches and lighthouses for our children in Situate that we needed to do more for the people who are raising children. This whole thing is so complicated and overwhelming, shrouded in stigma. People do not know what really prevents their kids from using substances. A lot of people think it's sports. It isn't. So we spend a lot of time, we, again, we did research, what's the best program to help parents prevent use? And we came up with, we looked to other communities, we looked to the SAMHSA databases, we looked to our mentors in DC, and Guiding Good Choices is the program we picked here. It's a four-part workshop for parents of nine to 15 year olds, and we've been doing it um, for five years with great results, and when parents graduate and finish the course, they say, um, why can't we make that a requirement? Everyone should have to take that if they have kids. So we might be looking at a local bylaw on that. Um, unfortunately, you can't make parents take it, but we're doing our best. We do lots of edu community education, which is great and it's necessary and people love to come out and learn, but that doesn't move the needle on addiction. We really have to look at evidence-based practices and that's a great one. School education, parent education. One thing that we've added and we continue to add is more support for families, more support for children in schools, their family members. We have many parents in Massachusetts, including in Situate, who are raising their grandchildren because of addiction. Our school developed a uh, support group called Loved Ones Raising Loved Ones that I'd love to share uh, more broadly. Some um, towns are adapting it. But there's lots of people where the parents are unable to care for their children, and there's a lot of stress on both the child to access curriculum and do well in school and not initiate substance use themselves, as well as for the, um, a, the parent caregiver person. We also offer um, psychoeducational support groups for students in school. I'm really proud of this. I'm proud of our school department for saying yes. In the middle school and the high school, we have a program called Kids of Promise. That is for students who have identified as dealing with substance use in their own family, so they're not using, but a family member, often a parent, might be struggling, and those kids are identified through school-based counseling, through self-referral, through an incident, from a lot of different ways, and we do that in school. We help these kids understand that it's not their fault and that they can't control it and that they're not alone. I always crack up when I start with that one. I wish we had that when I was young. Um, we also have a school-based support program for high school students who are using and maybe struggling with the reasons for their use. Um, again, those are facilitated by clinicians during school hours and wonderful supports. I'm also really proud to introduce Patrick Kent from Gosnell Treatment Center back there. We'll hear more about his, a special project with that treatment provider. But we also, our coalition called down there and said, listen, they have great treatment and great family support down in the Cape. I said, we need it up here and I harassed them into agreeing. And we now have a very vibrant family support group every Sunday hosted at the Situate Senior Center. Clinician is provided by Gosnold and families primarily from Situate, although it's open to all communities, come. Lots of parents of young adults who are dealing with opiate addiction, maybe doing okay, maybe not. It's a wonderful resource that we've built. That's something a coalition can do is identify the need. I'm not facilitating the group. We're not paying for the group. We're providing referrals and the, the municipal space to get it done. It's a great thing and all are welcome to that meeting. So providing more support. Also improved access to treatment. I was pretty surprised um, when I got started in this work. My kids are still, they're medium sized now, but they were little then and I wasn't quite aware about the, how hard it can be for parents to, to access mental health care for themselves and their children and certainly substance use treatment. Um, we have made great strides in connecting our community to early intervention and treatment, including Margaret Hanner, we'll get to speak later. We've subscribed to a mental health referral service, thanks to Jim's work, and getting, again, getting the people together. Um, I, I oversimplify things sometimes, but we're very lucky to have this helpline where someone can call up and say, I'm concerned about my daughter's eating disorder, I have Blue Cross Blue Shield, and I can only come after school. And then a little fairy from Interface Referral Service connects that person with a provider in the community. Although we're close to Boston, and there's great mental health care and primary health care and addiction treatment there, it can be hard to get outpatient care and really connect families. So that's, a, that's an intervention when we're looking at the little buckets behind me. What else have we done? Um, also, lots of police collaboration. We'll hear a story about that. And also having a local recovery high school. So as you know, Senator, we are at the forefront of providing that 
um, resource for our families in Massachusetts. We have five publicly funded recovery high schools in Massachusetts. Ryan Morgan is our principal, our local principal, and he's, he is probably speeding here from Logan Airport so he can speak later. If you can put the word out on that, don't pull him over. Uh, he really wants to be here, but we're really lucky to promote that resource. One of the, the, the aggravating things for me is that people don't know what some of these awesome resources are. So it takes a big mouth and a community coalition to get the word out there. We need in our school districts to let parents know that that's available to their kids. They don't have to go forever. They can get better in a safe and supportive environment and graduate from their sending school. It's pretty awesome. Um, and our role as a coalition is to let people know about that, to support the Recovery High School through state legislative um, financing and um, to make sure um, that we it stays part of our continuum. We're lucky to have it in Massachusetts. Okay, last but not least, overdose prevention. Um, although we are a primary prevention coalition and making great strides, we had all the people at the table, we have the police, we have the providers, we have the people in recovery, and we know we can do more. And that, I think, is the learning we've learned from this grant, is that once you get the people together and you have a true coalition, you can do more than just prevention. So we've worked really closely to, with our pharmacists, Mike, where's my coworker, Barbara Quinlan, um, to work with all the local pharmacies and situate to make sure they have standing orders for naloxone. We work with the situate police to make sure they were trained two years ago. We work with the school nurses and we host with our community um, clinic, we host um, confidential anonymous trainings all the time in the situate community. So it's really hard not to have Narcan if you live in situate. Um, that's a simple thing that everyone can replicate truly across the nation. Um, so whew, that's the gist of our program. There are many, many things that go on in between that, but I'd love to be able to share just four examples of sort of above and beyond success that we've enjoyed here in Situate. Um, one of the things, I'll probably cry again, one of the things I'm most proud of um, is our ability to mobilize the recovery community here. I always do. Um, so in our model, we have open coalition meetings with all those sectors I described. We meet at, at least every other month, lately it's been monthly, to have open meetings and review our projects and get the community involved. So sometimes a painful experience, but important to be transparent and engage our community. Well, a few years ago, my friend John Kimmett back here showed up at one of these meetings and he said, like everybody else says, I'll help. Put me to work, I can do it, I'm in long-term recovery. And I said, that's great, I took his email, I signed him up for the constant contact, and he kept showing up and kept offering his help. And so I said, well, what do you want to do? And that's, a lot, that's really how a lot of these things happen as well. Um, little did I know that John it was, a, at that time, um, a retired licensed addiction counselor, so a certified addiction counselor and an individual in long-term recovery. And little did he know that he's not really retired anymore. Uh, John now works for free. Um, and um, he accompanied me back in May 2015, so about two years ago, to the Situate Police Station when we were doing the Narcan training. So we asked um, Chief Stewart, who will get to speak also, um, you know, when we're doing Narcan reversals here in Situate, the people are going to South Shore Hospital, which is based in Weymouth. It's a big regional hospital, which actually has the second busiest emergency room in the state of Massachusetts, which is really shocking to me. Um, for, for its location and everything. Um, but generally people are held, if they have a non-fatal opioid overdose, they're held in the emergency room and they are not reversed on the ambulance and they are held there for about four hours, probably offered a brochure or maybe some treatment, this is before, and, um, and then released. So withdrawing on opiates, pro, pro, you know, adults, everyone is over 18 so they don't have to be checked out by mummy, and, and off they go, very often returning to use and absolutely always at very high risk of overdose death. So, Mr. Kimmett and I went to the chief and said, what if when we do a reversal in situate, we help the people get into treatment and you know, thank God for the Situate Police Department, they said yes. Um, so when we did the Narcan training, we also launched what we call the Situate Follow-Up Program, which is now a model for the entire country, and I'm hoping the nation, so we'll get to that. Um, but that's really how it happened, by welcoming, welcoming and engaging the community. So we started that in May 2015, we're doing the training with the police officers, they're assembling Narcan kits, and I'm doing my little thing with the brochures, and a police officer, I think it was uh, Detective Norton back there, said, I have a question, does it have to be opiates? I said, John, <laughs> does it? And John um, Kimmett said, of course not. We know very well what we're dealing with, and it is not just opiates. Since that time, we have been following up 
the Situate Facts Coalition, South Shore Peer Recovery, which is our new recovery support nonprofit, and the Situate Police have been offering treatment services to anyone in Situate that has a substance related emergency. Um, so it kind of happened around the same time as the Gloucester Initiative started, um, but it really started here with in that moment of crisis, whether it was a domestic incident, an alcohol related incident, or a non fatal overdose, we were there. We would meet them at the station, in a cell, at South Shore Hospital, at Dunkin' Donuts, bring the family to the Sunday meeting, whatever it takes to really wrap around that family while the window is open. And it's been extremely successful. 80% of all the people that we've met with have entered into treatment, um, and almost always within 24 hours. So usually detox, uh, but that is not always necessary for depending on the substance situation, but 80% right then. So that's a really remarkable example. Uh, but I couldn't leave well enough alone. We said, this it's not really fair. You have to live in situate to get this. Um, so we called upon our partners again to Jim, good old Jim Cantwell and Gosnell Treatment Center and said, wouldn't it be awesome if this was in the emergency room so everybody that has an non-fatal overdose or substance-related emergency could get help in that moment. You know, things you assume happen, that's not how it's set up. But now Patrick Kent is an, a recovery coach from Gosnell's embedded in South Shore Hospital, thanks to Jim Cantwell taking my crazy idea in running it up the ladder. We're really happy to have that. And I'm all, I really am almost done. Um, this same concept continues to, to spread. We have two police chiefs in Plymouth County based in East Bridgewater and Plymouth County that have started over the past year doing something similar, doing um, police responses. And we have partnered with them with Officer Mike Prouty in the back to launch that um, countywide. So beginning in May, we will be doing that in every community across Plymouth County, which is awesome. Uh, is this the hook? <laughs> okay, all right, that's it. Um, there are a few more that we'll share with you um, in your packet, but that's a really super idea um, that doesn't take many resources um, and is absolutely saving lives. So proud to be part of all this positive action. Right. Thank you. Wow, you can see what a dynamo that Emory is, and he was pointing out for different people here. So, in a moment, we're going to go through each prevention, intervention, treatment, recovery, to pick on people, to give, a, basically, folks, as you see, a two-minute overview. Again, your name, organization, your website, and the like. First, we're going to start with yeah, Tony Vignani. I, I, I just want you. to make one quick comment. Emory is an awesome asset to the town. We wish you could follow her energy. It's, it's out of this world. <laughs> but she said so much there. I want to make sure the senator heard this one very, very important thing. There's a grant that we have that pays for Amory. It's a five-year grant, and we're on the last year. <clears throat> so that's one thing that clearly is going to you know, be in your arena that would be very, very helpful to keep this going. Because it's not a local project. It is, I was talking to people from all the way other towns. It's really, it's really a South Shore, if not state, if not country initiative that we're driving here in Situate. So um, again, didn't want that to be lost in, in the thousand things that we went through. So. Right. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I'll just I'll just uh, deal with that one issue. So that's a SAMHSA grant. That's right. And uh, when uh, I met my wife 32 years ago, um, and uh, and uh, Trish was there 32 years ago uh, when I met my wife. Uh, I was an Irish Catholic politician in Congress, and my wife was the um, um, a scientist at uh, SAMHSA in Washington. And uh, so she was in charge of Project Depression, uh, just creating this new program to destigmatize depression, mental health people. So that was her job. And so SAMHSA is clearly a key agency yes. to link mental health to substance abuse, which is the title of the agency of substance abuse and mental health. So that's SAMHSA. And that's where the grant came from for Trish and then the whole community then to come together to have this program. And so it's clearly something that's very successful. Uh, unfortunately, in the Trump budget for this year, there's an 18% cut to the Department of Health and Human Services. So I'm gonna fight that very hard so the funding is there because programs like this shouldn't just be a, a maintained, they should be expanded because now we've done the experimentation, we can see the models as they have unfolded. So that's going to be a big battle, but I don't think it's one we should lose because that's where this battle is going to be fought at the, at the local level, where people are able to intervene at the earliest possible time and to give the kind of treatment. So I just wanted to let you know, of course I'm going to be on your side to help you to extend this, but first comes this, as I said, 
a vision without funding is an hallucination. You need the money to have the personnel, to have the institutions that are in place that can then be reaching out to help. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. And I've been stealing that line over and over again since you delivered that at the State House, as Ben can attest. All right, so the first category, we want to have folks to give you stories about prevention. Um, so I'm going to call on, on first Dr. Joe Schrand, who has a, a program, Drug Story Theater. Doctor, if you want to be able to just discuss in, in two minutes or less uh, about what the program is. Do you want to come up there? Uh, sure. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here, Senator, for, and for all of you. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, Dr. Schrand, and I am the Chief of Adolescent Psychiatry at High Point Treatment Center. We have a program called CASEL, but what Jim has helped support is something called Drug Story Theater, and I think most of you know about it by now. What we do is we take kids in the early stages of recovery, we teach them improvisational theater, and then we use psychodrama, and they create scripted shows about the seduction of addiction to and recovery from drugs and alcohol. And then they perform these shows for middle schools and high schools, so the treatment of one becomes a prevention of many, and that's our slogan. The treatment of one becomes a prevention of many. In between each scene, the kids step out of character and they do a scripted PowerPoint presentation, three PowerPoint presentations through the show, teaching the audience about adolescent brain and why it's at such risk for lifelong addiction. So I don't know if you know the numbers, but if you start using drugs or alcohol after the age of 21, one out of 25 people are at risk for lifelong addiction. If you start using before the age of 18, that number goes from one in 25 to one in four. One in three if they're using opioids. So uh, that's what the audience is taught. Before the show, uh, all the kids in the audience are given a pre-show survey, asking them questions about the brain, about dopamine, about oxytocin, not oxycontin, about oxytocin, and they guess what are these things for. By the end of the show, we now can statistically prove that the perception changes. So we have some data that we can uh, share with you that shows that in a 45 minute show we can change the perception of kids so much that they are now saying marijuana is addictive even though before they thought it wasn't. And that's a really important thing. So the first year we performed in front of more than 10,000 people in the South Shore. Uh, this year we have a new show, it's just starting up. Uh, we were at um, the Zyterian Theater in New Bedford and they, they bust in over 900 students from the Greater New Bedford mm -hmm. area and you know New Bedford is one of the main hot spots right now of overdose. Uh, so we are really focusing on there. Uh, I have the privilege now of being able to start uh, adolescent clinics in New Bedford, Taunton, Plymouth, Middleborough, um, uh, so that we can, and, and Brock, and I already have one, so that we can really begin addressing this. So I just want to thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. I just want to add one more thing. Uh, this whole thing started, the opioid crisis in 2007. Uh, the CDC put out data just so you understand, if you, anybody see House, you know, the, the TV show House, right? So House was addicted to Vicodin. If you took all the prescription pain medications, all the opioid medications prescribed in 2007 and converted it to Vicodin, enough Vicodin was prescribed in the United States so that every single one of the more than 300 million people could have five milligrams of Vicodin every four hours for three weeks. That's where it started. Now, I, I like math, so I, I took, the Vicodin is about this big. If you were to line the Vicodin up from end to end, it would reach from here to the moon and back and three times around the Earth. That's how much Vicodin equivalent described. That's really part of where the opioid crisis really started. But the opioids are a stepping stone. The real place where things start is, uh, you know, marijuana and alcohol. And we do have kids coming in on heroin. Cath Castle is, is an adolescent substance abuse program, 13 to 17, 18 years old if they're in school. There are kids coming in on heroin. We're detoxing the whistle box. So, thanks, okay. Jim. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. All right, very good. By the way, as far as doctors, as you know, one of the main things is to try to make sure that people are prescribing less medication. And Dr. Tracy could not be here today from South Shore Hospital, but he is a leader. I do want to call from South Shore Hospital on an issue when we, when we talk about the value of intervention. Patrick Kent, who works at South Shore Hospital. Patrick, if you come up again, folks, try, let's try to do two minutes so we can do as much so the Senate can hear from as many of us as possible. Patrick. Hi, everyone. I'll keep it short. My name is Patrick Kent. I work for Gosnold. 
Uh, in the spring of 2016, Gosnold and South Shore Hospital partnered for what I view as a very innovative approach to combating this opioid crisis, and that is putting a recovery specialist embedded into the South Shore Hospital Emergency Department to work with patients who come there following an overdose. Since we've been there last year, I have seen over 200 patients. Of those 200, 124 patients have gone to treatment all within 24 hours. Um, and our readmission rates are down to about 35 to 40%. So something we're very proud of. Um, this is something I'm very passionate about. This is a non-clinical peer specialist role. What does that mean? If I have a difficult time engaging with a patient during that critical point after an overdose, I can raise my hand and say, I'm a person in long-term recovery. Sometimes they let their guard down because we're dealing with a patient who are in the, in the acute stages of a very chronic disease. Um, so that's really it. I just want to take a minute and introduce myself. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and Senator Patrick's being too modest because he was highlighted. Channel 4 came to South Shore Hospital, the first location of having these recovery coaches. And I do want to point out, Emory, it was out of one of the, the uh, one of the FAX meetings, we should, we should really do this, Senator. And as you know, we learn from others. And with Patrick's help, with Joan's help, we are able to fund that. Uh, speaking of another person uh, who really deserves uh, great credit, but is always very modest, our chief of police here in situ was the first person I ever heard say, we're not going to arrest our way out of this problem. And Mike Stewart, you deserve so much credit for coming to all these, uh, all these meetings, educating each and every one of us. I know you had a question you wanted to pose uh, to the Senator. Yeah, it's with the prevention, intervention, and uh, the treatment and recovery. We've gotten very good at managing that on the street. We have people that uh, on the front lines with us, John Kimmett, Anne Marie, recovery coaches, and peer recovery. What we run into is, at times, and it's very frustrating, it's frustrating for us, frustrating for the families, are the, you know, the private health care insurers, uh, they, will only authorize certain treatments. I think we're at the point right now where we can come up with best practices. We know what treatments work. So insurance companies should be required to cover that for a certain period of time. We've been looking at this problem for a long, long time. And some treatment programs are better than others. And if it falls within these allowable treatments, then the health insurance provider should have to cover that over a period of time. And uh, I, I know a lot of families who have spent tens of thousands of dollars, in some cases over $100,000, trying to get one child squared away. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, it's frustrating when you have a child all set to go to one treatment, and all of a sudden they can't go because that insurance provider won't cover that. They want them to go here. Mm -hmm. And it's completely contrary to what we just spent hours and hours telling this person that this is where we'd like them to go. So, you know, if it's within certain parameters of best practices, I think the health insurance companies have to stop being held accountable for paying within those uh, those relationships. Yeah, and so, uh, thank you, Chief. So, uh, you know, in, you're right on the money. And again, it just goes to this whole issue of destigmatization, whether it be mental health or substance abuse. Right? How are we going to treat these diseases? Uh, and that just goes to the destigmatization of them. If you give people the treatment, you can treat mental health issues, you can treat substance abuse issues, but you have to treat it like a disease. And so for too long, too many people just view those issues as kind of character weaknesses. You know, there's a problem in that family, but somehow or other that family where there is now a realization that these are illnesses. And even as Anne Marie, Anne -Marie said, uh, for many people there's a predisposition to this. Okay? There, there is a vulnerability that, uh, that uh, pre-exists. So, so you need to just recognize it as that. And so, uh, and, and Jim, I'm going to just speak here and just say that I think when Massachusetts moved, I think they were able to get the insurance companies to have 14 days right. of coverage. Yeah. I think that's the standard of coverage. But as you know, Chief, um, bottom line is, it's going to take the first week just to kind of get this stuff out of the person's system so they can have a brain that can begin to think about what they're going to do with the rest of their life, right? And so you, you, need to, 
you, you need to have more than one more week in order to deal with it, right? And if you put the program in place, the best practices, you're increasing the probability that there won't be a U-turn exactly. and have there be just a return to the very same behavior. And so the, the more that we you know, have this understanding of the problem, which we now have. In other words, we don't need any more commissions to understand what the best practices are. Right? We don't need to you know, have any uh, deeper understanding. We've finished that phase okay, over the last three, year, three years. We've all learned. Okay? This thing came like a storm. But thank God we've had enough programs like this that then give us the information we need to give to the families what they're going to need in order to help their family members. So I agree with you 100%. And uh, even when we were having a big debate three weeks ago about the repeal of the Affordable Care Act on the floor of, first it was the House of Representatives and it was going to come over to the Senate then, one of the things that that bill was going to do is to remove coverage for 2.8 million Americans for substance abuse treatment. Now, who are those 2.8 million people who are now covered who have substance abuse problems? You take away that coverage. Well, those 2.8 million people would then become almost guaranteed victims at some point down the line because they just wouldn't have the treatment options that would be made available to them with the insurance coverage that the Affordable Care Act was going to provide to them. And again, in most instances, it's going to be in a lower income category, you know, where uh, you might not have the same uh, level of family support that would exist in a situation, right? So, so you just have to be realistic about, you know, what uh, all of this, you know, needs in order to be uh, successful. I, if I can ask you, and so I agree with you 100%, and we have to put the pressure on the insurance companies to give parity to these diseases to the mental health and substance abuse issues. That's the law, but it's not the practice, even today. And so it's just gonna require additional hammering of the insurance industry in order to deal with this issue. And, uh, and if we do it, then we have a real probability of increasing the uh, likelihood that someone can come out at the other end of this uh, with a life that goes out until age 80 and 90 and they've had this aberrational period when they were younger. But if we don't provide the support system, it's not going to work. Let me ask you a question, Chief. Um, in 2017, in terms of your own force, are you seeing a maintenance of or a decline in the number of times where you have to administer Narcan here in the city, in the town? Uh, it, that stack can be deceiving. Okay. Because Generally, a lot of the, uh, the overdoses are in conjunction with your treatment programs. They're in treatment, they get out, they relapse, and they overdose. So uh, are we seeing an, an increase in it? No. You're not? Good. Uh, we've kind of leveled off, but again, you know. But, we, not, we but it hasn't gone down yet. Level off. <laughs> we, we felt we leveled off a few years ago when we had five overdose deaths in a year. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's peaks and valleys. But, Sometimes your uh, overdose stats and your can the amount of times that it's administered, yes. can be deceiving because it does coincide mm -hmm. with the amount of people that you have in uh, recovery. And we've made a big effort to get Narcan into the hands of the families. So the Narcan may not be administered by the first responder. It might be administered by the family, so they don't. So I mean, because, because Narcan is so much more readily available yeah, to families that the, the policeman or the fireman might not be the first responder, it might be a family member now, and it might not get reported. So the uh, as well. yeah. can I see. Is that what you agree with that, Chief? Yeah, stats are okay. skewed. Because, because of that, it's very difficult to you know, put your finger on that. That's very And at Castle, we give every kid who's on opioids a prescription for Narcan when they leave. But Narcan is fascinating. It's the only medicine that I prescribe that I encourage people to use with someone else. You know, all of the medicines, that's called diversion. Right. But this one, it's okay, I'm going to give you the prescription, but if you got something next to you, you need to use it, use it. Which would, for any other medicine, would be like a violation Absolutely. of the Hippocratic <laughs> Oath. But here, that's it's exactly the full right. implementation of the right. Hippocratic Oath. That's, exactly yeah. right. that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Senator, next we want to hear from Margaret Hanna, who runs this program we've been bragging about interface. Margaret. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Martin, you. for Appreciate being here. It. And others, I'm honored to be here. I, I, Interface.williamjames.edu. 
uh, toll free number 888-244-6843. I'll leave some postcards for people that also have that information on it. Just here in the town of Situate in the past year, we have matched over 200 individuals with mental health referrals. I want to make sure that I underscore the word matched because as some of you may know, you can get a number, you can call, you can possibly get an appointment, but unless it's a match, it doesn't work. And even when it is a match, there might be a match for a short period of time, and then you need to call back again. And that's one of the beauties of this service, is that it's never a no. It's always, okay, here, and maybe call again. I just want to quickly just read you a comment from a parent. I was looking for a counselor for my son. I took home the postcard. It has been an excruciating seven years for me and my family. When I called, the individual on the other end of the phone understood that this situation of addiction was not only affecting my son, but it was also affecting myself and the entire family. Through this phone call, the person on the other end of the phone listened to me and talked with me about how it might be if I, and I'm speaking for the person on the other end of the phone, considered a counselor myself. I did that, I called, I got services, and now my family, two years later, is much healthier. That example goes to what Anne Marie and said earlier, and that we all know here, is that it takes collaboration, it takes looking at the entire family, it takes not giving up, and it takes someone listening. So that's what Interface Referral Service will do, does do, will continue to do. Another statistic, while yes, we're here in Situate, we also are in nine other towns here on the South Shore, and that's a result of our wonderful Representative Cantwell and Senator O'Connor. And in the entire area, we have, in three years, we have served over 1,500 individuals. The problem's not going away, but we're trying. So I thank Anne Marie, I thank all of you for all the good work we're doing because we have to all continue to do it together. So thank you very much for the thank opportunity to be here. And I'll just leave these postcards here. So the message there is that these families are heroes, but heroes need help. Right. So you need to have some kind of a system which is put in place. Uh, my mother had Alzheimer's. My father was a milkman for the big milk company. Uh, and so, there's no bigger right arm than a hood milkman who <laughs> had six milk bottles all day long. Okay, so that arm is the size of my upper thigh. Mm -hmm. So he was able to keep my mother at home <coughs> at age uh, 78, 80, 82, 84, 86, 88. She's not going away yet. We're going to keep her right here in the living room. But you know what made it possible? The, the, uh, uh, the nurse that came in for an hour a day, just that little bit of help, gave him a break gave him company, gave him a way of viewing the whole thing. So I've actually made that now a model program for HHS uh, because it, will, it makes it easier for families to be able to participate uh, in the whole process, which is going to be indispensable and being successful. So what you're talking about is something that obviously is what's going to be necessary uh, if you're going to be there all day long every single day, you know, as a part of the, the long-term solution that a lot of these people are going to need is to keep the same. There has to be a continuum of care here, uh, the insurance industry, but also programs that help the families to reinforce it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Senator. And Senator, next from South Shore Peer Recovery, have both Katie and John Kimmett want to tell about their stories of what they've been able to do here for the entire South Shore. Thanks. You can start. All right. <laughs> My name's... Uh, John Kim and I'm a person in long-term recovery and uh, I'm involved with uh, as Katie is and Anne Marie is and, uh, and a whole lot of other people with uh, social peer recovery. Um, there are 23 million people in the United States that are in recovery. Where are they? You know, they're, they're now coming into view and uh, 23 million people in recovery is a tremendous resource and it's become part of the continuum of care. Recovery, you can see it right here. Continuum of care, prevention, intervention, treatment. It's all part 
all wrapped up in recovery. The 10 community recovery centers in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and all this goes on. Prevention, intervention, treatment in the recovery community. Um, you know, and that's our ultimate goal is to have here on the South Shore a community center it, that, that where, where all the recovery activities are, are, uh, are anchored. Um, the general public, all they see of, of uh, um, addiction is what they read in the paper, and that's all negative stuff. They don't know about recovery. They don't know about the sunny side of, of addiction. They don't know what it's like to rise out of the ashes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and therefore the stigma, you know. So recovery, a, a vibrant recovery center, a recovery community will show people, you know, that, that, that there's no need for stigma. Does this look like an addict? <laughs> I don't um, think so. I'm Katie Sharon. Yeah. I'm a person in long-term recovery. Um, you know, and I started out at age 12 picking up alcohol, and um, I was saved by a local police department with Narcan. Um, after an opiate overdose. And, you know, I, I work with a lot of people. I get a lot of referrals from Anne Marie, who gets them from Situa Police. Um, but for me, you know, when I came out of treatment, like addiction doesn't go away. It's a disease that'll have lifelong. And, um, you know, I found a 12 step recovery program that worked for me, and that's where I found my recovery community. I think that's, that's the most important thing. You know, people can get into treatment. Um, but you come out and a lot of people have to go home. And like, what do you do when you go home? You need that support. And um, social peer recovery helps to provide that, kind of bridge that gap. Um, I'm able to talk to people about my experience, which helps them, um, you know, I don't know, I wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for um, a local police department, if it wasn't for the treatment that I got, if it wasn't for coming back and jumping into a community of recovering people just like I am. Um, my life is completely different today um, than it was when I came in to the program, but um, you know, social peer recovery is just so important to me. I've talked to so many people and just to see their faces when I share my story with them and to know that they're not alone and that there's another side of addiction. There is recovery and it's such an amazing life. Um, you know, the hope. We marched in the, the Citrate Parade this year and I love marching. I love saying that I'm in recovery. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm very proud of it because, you know, it's given me a life. It's given my children my, their lives back. Um, I have two little boys. They were really young when I came in and, you know, they have a sober mom today. Um, so I can't say enough about, you know, these, it, recovery happens in the community, you know, it happens in the community and um, social peer recovery helps to bridge that gap. We help to, you know, give tools and ideas of what to do next. Um, that's all I can say. Thanks. So, so Senator, I, I do want to note in closing, I, I was talking to your staff and, and they were saying that you've got several other stops yeah. to make, but we want to want to thank you, first of all, for your leadership, because it really does start with you as a United States Senator, bringing attention to this over and over again, reduces the stigma. For Pat O'Connor, our state senator, for our state representative, Joe Moschino, all these things. But Situate, again, needs to be applauded because uh, one of the things we saw earlier today, we had a coastal resource officer, Nancy Durfee, was showing of how the town would be able, because of funding that position, to tackle uh, some of the coastal resource needs. We also have Laura Maneri here as a manager of social services, another position that gets funded through the town to make sure that you're able to help connect people who have these tremendous needs. And I want to note that for Greg Ranieri here from the schools who helped co-found Situate Facts, we have our superintendent from Marshfield as well who's been a member of Marshfield Facts. For everybody who's here, Senator, we will stick around for folks if people have questions or more information you want to, to, to uh, give to us. But I do know Senator wanted to leave the, the can, can you close your remarks? Can I just ask if I, if I may, Jim? Please. Uh, if Senator O'Connor, uh, Representative Machina, would like to add anything to talking about the Senate today? Just, I wanted to just thank everyone for the opportunity to listen. I think it's really important in our positions at the state level and at the federal level to really listen to what you have to say. Uh, hear about the best practices that have been working down here in Situ and across the South Shore and take that back and make sure that we continue to fight for the funding that's necessary in order to make that uh, reality to continue to expand these programs. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. And Senator, as you know, Senator, thank you. You're on Promote Prevent, the commission that we have. That's doing, we have handouts. We did, uh, we'll talk about it. Thank you, Senator. 
Um, so I would just add my thanks uh, to the senators. Uh, I'm always, aware of Anne Marie, I'm always so impressed every time I hear you speak um, about your dedication and your commitment, um, but also about uh, elucidating all of the best practices. And I'm very excited uh, and would add my voice uh, to, the, to the selectments to advocate for continued funding for this um, because this is going to help uh, other parts of my district, Hingham, Hull, and Cohasset, which are now just starting um, to emulate some of these programs. So uh, for a few dollars invested in situate is going to have a tremendous regional and probably statewide impact. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you again for all your work and for including me uh, today. Uh, it was really incredibly in informative and I, I like Senator O'Connor, uh, agree. It's always great to be here and to listen to all the great work you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. And, uh, uh, with, uh, thank you all so much um, for being here. Thank you for everything that you're doing on this issue. Thank you for being a model community for the country. You're showing what can happen when a community comes together and says that they're going to solve a problem. It's not easy. It's going to take time. But at least now, we're beginning to see that when you put together all of the pieces uh, uh, of the puzzle, that there is hope that we can give uh, to families, the children someday might have to look to the history books to find that there ever was such an epidemic as this heroin, fentanyl, prescription drug uh, epidemic, which is hitting us right now. When Trish was starting with me, there were public health crises at the time. Love Canal, chemicals in the water, chemicals in the soil. Woburn, Massachusetts, which ultimately became the movie A Civil Action. Chemical companies, Monsanto and others, just dumping these chemicals into the water. Children contracting leukemia at 10, 15 times the rate of other communities in the country, but no funding in order to deal with it. So we had to pass a bill called Superfund to get the funding to finally put it into communities so that we could try to deal with them in community after community. Trish was on my staff in 1980 when we got that law passed. Then the AIDS crisis came up. More denial. Denial about it. Denial about who was affected by it. Denial about what was going to happen if we didn't put the funding in place that we admitted that it existed, that we did the research so that we could begin to deal with these issues. And ultimately, research is medicine's field of dreams from which we harvest the findings that give hope to families that there is uh, a better day that is ahead. And so ultimately, we had to pass Ryan White's law to begin the funding for AIDS. And uh, we had to ultimately <laughs> even uh, come to the realization that the highest percentage of increase was women getting HIV, women getting AIDS, uh, which would not have been the perception when we started the whole crisis. But it needed more public education. We needed to explain that it knew no racial or income or gender barrier. And that's what we've been doing with this epidemic right now. And so all issues go through three phases, political education, political activation, political implementation. And so the political education, in my opinion, it's done. People now understand this issue. And they understand that uh, whether you're in Lexington, um, Massachusetts, or Lexington, Kentucky, it's the same issue. What I did in May of 2015 uh, is I called Mitch McConnell, the majority leader, and I said, Mitch, Kentucky and Massachusetts are at the top of this list. You and I, we should make a request for a Surgeon General's report on opioids in our country. So he agreed with me. We made the request. I called Vivek Murthy, who was the Surgeon General of the United States, and I said, you should do this Surgeon General's report. It'll be the same level of impact as the smoking report of C. Everett Coop in 1965. That was the turning point. 50% of all adults in 1965 smoked. It's a crazy number. My father died from lung cancer. 
My father died from the two packs of camels. You know? So that's just the reality of it. So <clears throat> how, where are we today? Now it's under 20%. It's not perfect, but it's a far cry from where it was because the public education activation implementation went into place. So the Surgeon General said to me, well, usually it takes two years to do a Surgeon General's report. That's May of 19, uh, uh, of, uh, of 2015. That means it wouldn't be out yet. It would come out next month. I said, you don't have two years. This is right now. This is happening. We need you and we need the whole federal government to be branding this as this kind of an issue because that will trigger the activation. Ultimately, the implementation of the programs, the extra support programs for families, the extra insurance coverage, Chief, that is out there for families, um, the extra programs top to bottom for treatment, which will give families this opportunity to be able to deal with this issue. So um, from my perspective, we've made a lot of progress over the last three years since I was in Taunton hearing the word fentanyl for the first time. And actually a Boston Globe reporter that day in the press conference said, so what do you think is the cause of this problem? And, and I said, well, what the people here in Taunton are saying to me is it's a chemical called fentanyl which is being added. That's what's leading to the spike. And that was on the front page of the Globe the next day, the first time fentanyl had been in the Globe. Huh? That's only three years ago. So we've had to learn a lot do a lot to get to today. And we have a lot more work to do so that we can find the funding for these types of programs to which you have here uh, and to expand them all across the United States of America. So we thank you all so much for everything which you are doing. Uh, you have incredible leaders here in situ at the best in America uh, working on this issue, putting it together in a package. Uh, and it's just so great to know that, again, on a bipartisan basis, Jim Cantwell and Senator O'Connor and Representative Machino, we're going to work together to solve this problem because failure is not an option. Okay? There's just too many lives at stake. And you can see where the numbers would go nationally, 100,000 a year. And it's just an avoidable catastrophe. Uh, we did that with Ebola. When Ebola hit, five billion dollars got appropriated to deal with it, okay? We're not putting up, we're putting up about 10% of that for this epidemic. No one died of Ebola in the United States, but people are still dying from this in our country. And we know that if we put the funding in, we could get the same result that we have with Ebola. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna work hard, do it on a bipartisan basis. Thank you all so much.